yeah, you kind of grow into responsibility. And like when I started Airbnb, I didn't intend to start this company. In fact, everyone you, you mentioned, none of them I think set up to start the company they eventually built. I set out one weekend to be able to pay my own rent by inflating three air mattresses with my, my roommate. And you know, it's not like you like some jobs where you apply for it, you grow it, you create it. And the responsibility grows. And I never felt my responsibility more than during the pandemic when we had lost a huge amount of our business, people's jobs were at risk, investors' money was at risk, guests you know, wanted refunds, hosts needed to make money, and they were depending on me to pay the rent or mortgage. And so the responsibility I feel is primarily to the people who like come to work every day for Airbnb, the people who give me money, the people who trust me with their vacations, the like four million plus people who depend on Airbnb you know, for, to, to make supplemental income. It's an immense amount of responsibility. It's also like, I was asked in a prior interview, like why do I keep working? Why do I keep doing this? And many of us like don't need to keep doing this for financial reasons, but we didn't do it for financial reasons to start. You know, I think the pro like entrepreneurship can be a great way to make money. The problem with doing it only to make money is the failure rate is so high that there's also a really good chance that you'll end up with nothing at the end. And so if you don't love it and you're only doing it for financial reasons, you might quit and if it doesn't work, it won't have been worth it. But if you did it because you loved it, then it might still have been a worthy uh, pursuit even if it doesn't work the way you imagined it. But I feel incredibly lucky to be considered alongside other great entrepreneurs. There are probably three Brian's. Brian Entrepreneur, the one who started this, the Brian CEO of a public company, and the <laughs> Brian after COVID. Yes. What has changed and what has stayed in all that different Brian's? I think what's changed is I have more gray hairs. I used to have brown <laughs> hair, now I have gray and brown hair. Um, I feel like I am like 42 going on 62 years old because I think the pandemic, I lived like a couple decades of experience. You know, I mean, it was the biggest disrupt in, in our lifetime and by many, many measures. And I think I really grew up as a CEO. And I think the company Airbnb grew up. I think we got more disciplined. I think we got more focused, more responsible, more decisive. I think it became a better leader and I think the company um, became a better company. I think the things that never changed were our motivations, our sensibility, our heart, our soul, the reasons that we started the company. In many ways, I'm just a more grown up version of that same person that started the company 16 years ago. That I still am doing it for the same reasons. I still love to bring people together. I love hosting. I hosted 16 years ago and I'm hosting again today. I love designing and obsessing over the product 16 years ago, and I'm still obsessing over the design of the product today. I love talking about the products and services, and I'm still doing all the interviews. I'm not just going to other people. You know, many of the ideals, the principles and the values don't change. I mean, if something is a mission, it's a value, it's a principle, these words, they usually mean things that don't change or only evolve a little bit. But then other things you want to evolve, you want to grow. And I think I've been constantly challenged, constantly grown, and I think the company's grown up. Why did that, being a career designer give you the conviction to create like a new category, a new industry? Yeah, I think that, yeah, I think, let's see. We never really set out to create a new category, to create a new industry, but we did set out to come up with a design solution to a problem. And I have to say that like people should always, like a great way to start a company is to pro find a problem in your life that you want a solution to, or something that doesn't exist, even at a small scale, that you would love if, if it existed, just make it for yourself. Now, as long as you are at least somewhat similar to millions of other people, if you solve your own problem, you've actually solved the problem for millions of other people. And while Joe and I were in some ways unique, we were also pretty regular. We're ordinary guys. We could barely afford our apartment in San Francisco. We liked to meet different people. We were happy to show off our space. We didn't want just random strangers in our house. We wanted to know a little bit about who they were. So we had solved the problem for our own lives. But I think that like a designer is much more than somebody who designs the way something looks. Like you saw that presentation today and hopefully everything looked really cool. But we also have to try to think about like, how can we intelligently solve the problem of people checking into the Airbnbs? You don't go to a front desk, you don't get a key card. How can we make it really integrated? Well, we have to work with these smart lock integrators. Well, how do you actually do that and make it really simple? How do you actually make it so that people don't have to go through 50 steps and that it like is totally intuitive? 
What happens when it's night and they don't know how to use that lock and everyone's different? Well, we're gonna create a little animation to teach them. So it's like a bunch of things like that. The guest favorites was a program design. That was a design, but the design wasn't just the look, it was the program. How many reviews do you need to have? What's the rating? What's the host cancellation rate? You know, we wanted to be big enough that it encapsulated enough listings, but not so big that it didn't really mean enough to be distinct. So I just think that designers love to solve problems. The bigger we get and the more problems we solve, the more in some ways pro new problems that emerge. And so there will be never, we'll never run out of things to solve. Going back also to COVID, Airbnb was like the rising star before COVID. Uh, the pandemic came, you had to make layoffs, uh, you had to restructure the company, rethink the business maybe. Who supported you in those difficult times? I mean, so many people, and I want to start with my co-founders, Joe and A. I I mean, you know, I think that like I got lucky when I started Airbnb and the main luck I had was I started with great people. A lot of founders break up. A lot of co-founders don't talk to each other anymore. Joe and I still talk nearly every week. You know, we try to have this recurring Sunday call. Sometimes it's other days of the week where we just check in. And there's very, very few stories with companies that have reached the scale of Airbnb have been going on for a decade and a half and the co-founders still talk every week, let alone talk at all. Um, beyond that, I kind of was great support all over the place. I like to say that you learn a lot about people in a crisis. And the good news is what I learned is that like 99% of people were amazing or 90 something percent people were amazing. They were, as I expected, even better. And then you have people that might disappoint you. But the luckily I had surrounded myself with a lot of great people that I was loyal to. They were very loyal to me and they believed in me. You know, existing employees even current employees, like both former employees, <clears throat> many hosts, um, many guests, you know, investors, shareholders. And so- Which you help you in, these, in those times? Well, I would say like, I just like to point out a couple, like I have a few VCs on my board. So like Alfred Lin um, is a venture capital Sequoia, mm -hmm. you know, Ken Chenault is at Journal Catalyst, Jeff Jordan is at Juice & Horowitz. They were really helpful and they joined weekly board calls every Sunday. I would say like special shout out to um, Egon at Silver Lake and um, the team at Sixth Street, you know, Alan and team. And I thought that like they were, um, they, they really stepped up um, with uh, financing and I think it was April 2020 when it maybe wasn't obvious that like a company should, you know, put in a billion dollars into the company. And so um, eventually we did $2 billion debt round. So I think they came to the table. Um, so I, th I think there were others as well. Who did you turn, and not I'm talking about like uh, money or inver investors, who did you turn to? Who did you ask for advice, maybe in the value or in the ecosystem? Well, there are numerous people I asked advice to. Um, maybe I'll, I'll point out two or three. Um, one was Ken Chenault, who's on my board. He was CEO of American Express. In American Express, he had to lead American Express during 9-11, um, which was the most disruptive travel event in our lifetime in 2008, the financial crisis, which is the most disruptive financial event since the Great Recession. And he always told me that one day, you know, odds are you'll experience something like I experienced with 9-11 in 2008 and you need to be prepared. And then when, not, when the pandemic broke out, he said, this isn't as bad as 2008 or 9-11 for travel. This is probably 10 times worse. And he was right. The impact was an order of magnitude bigger than 9 11 or 2008 on travel, at least for that period of time when the world was shut down. And, you know, I remember him telling me, this is your defining moment as a leader. You know, I remember that, like, I have Hiroki Asai, who's on my executive team now, and then Johnny Ive, who I work with, both were at Apple when Apple was 90 days from bankruptcy. You know, we never were on the brink during the pandemic, but it, we weren't sure if we were because we didn't know how long people wouldn't travel. And eventually they did start traveling and they used Airbnb. But it's April or May of 2020, you don't know that. All we know is we are now hemorrhaging hundreds of millions of dollars a month. And not every investor wants to give us more money. And people aren't traveling, people are not crossing the border, they're not going to like urban areas and people were proclaiming, is this the end of Airbnb? Will Airbnb exist in the future? And so Johnny and Roki would tell me stories of Apple and then, you know, former President of the United States Barack Obama, I kind of have said before that he was a mentor and 
uh, you know, part, uh, help, uh, you know, really gave me advice and he checked in with me. And if there was ever a person who's dealt with like big crisis and could put this one in perspective was him. So, but I would really just call out like many of my team members, my board, they were really, they gave me a lot of advice. How, how do you get, get back to those like great expectations that Airbnb had? Right, like they're, like, yeah, when people give you money, like it's it's like a it's like a new ball game. It's like a new game. It's like it's like the analogy is like you can win a, a sports game, but every game is zero zero. And when you have venture capitalists, it's not really zero zero because if they gave you money early on, but if you're like a hundred times bigger, they made a hundred times their money. But if people buy your stock in the public market, they don't care how much money you made the last investor. They're a, it's a new ball game, so it's kind of like sports. It's like every day you got to show up. It only matters so much what you did the day before. What you did the day before may give you advantages for the future, but it doesn't put any points on the board. So I use that as motivation. I make sure everyone knows we can't be complacent, that you know we can't rest on our laurels of past success, that you know we have to always be pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zone. It's why like I'm 42 years old, Airbnb is like a really large company, and yet I'm still involved in the product, still doing like all these interviews day and night till it's dark outside, because I just feel so passionate about what we're doing. And I think the passion and intensity I bring is gonna permeate across the company. Did you think to quit maybe in the pandemic? No, no, never, never occurred to me to quit because I just love what I do. And I'm one of the people that, you know, when I feel embattled, I generally fight and I try to dig deep, but also like, you know, I'm not a parent, but I do think of Airbnb like, you know, like, like a, I feel like a co-parent of Airbnb and if you, I mean, maybe this is an inappropriate metaphor, but if your child's sick, you never want to abandon them. So I felt like the more <clears throat> trouble Airbnb was in, the more motivated I was to step in and help. And so when Airbnb had troubles, instead of stepping away, I dove in. And not only did I dove in, dive in I dived in, I dove in like day and night, Monday through Sunday for like a year. How do you imagine Airbnb in 10, 10 years more? I think, I hope that half of Airbnb is exactly like it is today. I hope its principles, its values, what we stand for is exactly like today. That we still stand for having like millions of hosts, maybe tens of millions of hosts, that are some of the most wonderful, kind people in the world that share their world. That we're a brand that's based on bringing people together and human connection. That we sit at the intersection of design and technology. But twice a year, I can invite you to these big events that they maybe get even bigger and the products get amazing, more amazing. I hope though, though that we're not just in the business of home rentals. Yeah. I hope that yeah. we're not, I'm not just standing here 10 years from now telling you about all the feedback guest knows have given us and that I want to tell you today about all the improvements we made based on feedback to our core business of home rentals. I hope whatever I'm talking about, home rentals is a part of a much, much, much larger story. What that story is, we're still we're still working through because you know I think there's a lot of areas we can participate in but I want to make sure that like we use our time our energy our talent our resources in the best way possible you know with AI I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities this is the biggest technological change of our lifetime I think it's already starting to change and improve our business like the photo tour is just a small thing but the fact is that in, we were able to create a model that could scan 100 million photos not long from now, you'll be able to go on Airbnb, take photos of your house, and not only will it order by room, but it can read all the photos, it can actually create a floor plan, it could write a description, it could create all the amenities, it could potentially even suggest a price based on the photos. It can take the photos and eventually be able to change them by time of day or season. So it's winter, it could, have, it could show you what it might look like with snow. So, and that's just one of like a hundred things. So there's gonna be like so many ways to be able to update Airbnb and maybe, maybe that's another reason I wanna be here for it. Okay, what about two more questions? Two more questions? Go for it. But how you fun here? I am. Actually, <laughs> you're one of my most fun interviews. I mean, I'm not just saying that, you know. Every interview is really different and some people take more interest in different parts and other. Here, 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 here's something I'll say and we'll keep going, but some, interview, some interviewers asked me about what's happening right now. Like, I read about this, I read about this, I read about this, I read that. Those are very topical interviews. And those are fine. The problem with those kind of interviews is three years from now, 
those are gonna be really dated. And when you see videos of me on YouTube of interviews, they ask me about this news, that news, that news. First of all, they have very few views. No one cares, they have no posterity. So I think what you're asking are things that people will be, like, will be, they have posterity yeah. to them. You said recently that Airbnb was like broken internally. Uh, I know this is a tough question. And you had built four pillars and you need to build at least six more. That's what I, I think I remember that was part of the interview. Uh, what are those missing six pillars? Or how are you building those? Maybe with John Ive or with- Yeah, so I think that the key thing I would say is that I think that with this release, we've turned the corner. I think that nearly every piece of feedback that we've gotten from guests or hosts, we've at least maybe not fully resolved, but we made a meaningful step forward. You know, guests told us last year that they felt like cleaning fees were adding up. We, you know, really worked hard to move to upfront pricing. Now 260,000 hosts have removed or, 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 or reduced their cleaning fees. Guests told us that they want a faster customer service. We now have significantly faster customer service. Guests told us they want Airbnbs to be more reliable like hotels. We now have 2 million homes that I feel like we can stand behind based on the reviews and the data from guests. So I think that this release is the moment we turn the corner. I think the next releases, May and beyond, we're still gonna be making improvements based on feedback we're getting, but we're now ready to do new things. So I think that the foundation, the pillars are built. Do you regret the IPO? Never, no, I, I, I actually think like, there's a number of reasons why um, I think the IPO is a good thing. I will, I think the first reason why is that we had a lot of shareholders and ultimately, you know, you want to make sure that shareholders get liquidity. And I have a lot of stories from employees and former employees that said that the IPO like made a transformational impact in their lives. Um, hosts were able to buy stock in the IPO, and then the day we went public, the price doubled, and a lot of hosts made a lot of money. Three, before Airbnb, only like you know a handful of investors and employees had stock. Now, like people on the street and friends and other people can own Airbnb and they can be partners. I also think the discipline of a public company, I was forewarned about like how terrible it would be, I mean, in quotes, to be a public company. And I gotta tell you that like, it's also not easy to be a late stage private company. It wasn't easy to be a late stage private company where like, you, you know, so, so I think that the discipline, you know, there can be a lot of pressure on a short term basis. The job of a CEO is to have courage, to have a backbone and try to manage and balance the short term pressures that it's just a part of life. It's a part of like every part of life with the long-term ambitions and dreams. And I think that if you can build trust and credibility with investors, they will, you know, they, they will give you benefit of the doubt within reason. But, you know, it's also like, like a sports game and you got to prove yourself every day. But I also think that can be a form of motivation. Last one. What do you think about what recently happened with WeWork? You know, everybody uses WeWorks. I think it was a great product. I think that it was also maybe a cautionary tale that there is such a thing as raising too much money. And I think that, you know, a lot of companies, I think there was a period of time where when we started Airbnb, we started doing the financial crisis. We had very little money. I think not having a lot of money, it's counterintuitive. I think a lot of people think that the solution to a lot of problems is money. And that if you have more money, you can do more things. We have a fun saying that the, one of the best ways to slow a project down is to raise, to, to add more people to it. Now, yes, if you have no person working on it, you won't move. But sometimes the best teams are small teams. The, some of the best companies are companies that are focused. When you raise a ton of money, what ends up happening is you typically have too many people doing too many things, and you may be making investment decisions that if you didn't have an abundance of money, you would have been more and more, more and more considerate and more careful. So I think it was a cautionary tale about a company being disciplined or, you know, or maybe not having the necessary discipline and maybe having, you know, not enough constraints, you know, constraints breed creativity. And during the pandemic, we had a lot of constraints. I think those constraints made us better. Now you don't want to be overly constrained that you can't do anything and no one wants to work for you if you can't pay them. But, you know, ultimately, you know, I think constraints make you better. And I'm, you know, saddened to see that that's what's happened with WeWork. But, um, you know, I hope they, the, I hope the product still lives on because, you know, our office here in New York is in a WeWork. And I thought it was a great office. Yeah. And I, and so I, I think we've been, I think we've been happy customers. But.